So uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to part two of our conversation series, Factors of Collective Imagination in Art. Uh, these conversations are part of the project Art Organization, a long-term international research project that deals with the analysis of artistic self-organization in post-Yugoslav region. Simultaneously with this series of talks, a collaborative research working group is meeting <clears throat> on Mondays uh, through the program Fragments for Studies on Art Organization to analyze and review the materials created during this project. Uh, the project will be presented to the public in Novi Sad in Solv Gallery from July 20th to July 24th, so in a few days. Uh, the conversation series is a space for discussion about ad hoc and long-term art groups and collectives, as well as artistic infrastructures for the collective action, including production of knowledge and organizing political and revolutionary struggles. The series consists of three conversations. Ten days ago, um, we talked with Tomislav Medak and Cassie Thornton about connections between art and social movements. Uh, and about artistic platforms for collective care, hologram and pirate care syllabus. In the conversation to follow, called Art Groups and Social Political Engagement, we will discuss links between art groups and leftist movements, organizations and political parties before World War II and during the 60s, as well as issues about political organizing in art. Our guests today are Vida Knežević and Jakopo Galimberti, Vida Knežević is an art historian from Belgrade. She will talk today about the legal group Alive, or Život, in Serbian, active in period between the two world wars in the Kingdom of Yugoslavia. This group was part of revolutionary movement organized by the Communist Party of Yugoslavia at that time. Jacopo is an art historian from Italy, uh, currently living in Berlin. He will speak today about the work of Group N, which de developed its collective artistic practice during the 1960s in the intellectual political context of innovative Marxist thinkers uh, known as Operaista movement. Group N was simultaneously engaged with the new tendencies and international movement in art that gravitated around the Zagreb Gallery of Contemporary Art between 1961 and 1973. Before we start, uh, I would like to give you a short update about the situation in Serbia. Those of you that attended the talk 10 days ago were caught in the middle of clashes between protesters and police in Belgrade. Some of you were reporting tear gas in their flats via chat. What happened is that the police responded with brutal violence against protesters that gathered in front of a national assembly in Belgrade, but as well in other cities in Serbia. People gathered to protect against, protest against uh, this mismanagement of COVID crisis on the side of the government, as well as the years of austerity measures that have pushed people of Serbia to the edge of survival. Many people got arrested during the protests. Some claim that there are more than 150 people in jail today. Many of these people are our friends and comrades. Several of the jailed persons, including Miran Pogacar, Vladimir Mentus, Igor Šljepić, and Mario Marković, are also members of the ROOF anti-eviction organizations and anti-eviction organization that I am as well part of. <clears throat> Vladimir Mentus and Igor Šljepić have been released a few days ago just to be convicted again in less than 48 hours. These arrests clearly report an attempt of frightening people into obedience so that we wouldn't stand up to the tyranny. We will not stop fighting until the very last political prisoner and victim of the regime of oppression is free. During this webinar, we will run a live chat uh, session as well. It, um, if you have any questions, just pop them in the chat. Daria Medic, artist, digital practitioner and educator, will moderate this chat session and give a summary of the discussion during the session. She will also read your questions to our guests. If you have any technical issues, please ask Daria for help in the chat. If you miss anything, don't worry. The recording will be available on the website of PUDA.org after this event. <clears throat> My name is Anna Vilenica. I'm an activist and researcher and traditional social movements, housing struggles, and art. 
I will be your host today. I would like to thank Huda.org from Novi Sad for giving me a chance to organize these encounters. I hope you will enjoy these talks as much as I did preparing them. Our previous encounters uh, was or our previous encounter was organized around two series of short presentations that Thomas Lovmedak and Cassie Thornton prepared for us. This time I would like to propose a different format, uh, a sort of like a Q&A session that will give us a chance to develop a comparative perspective between two case studies, Grupa Život and Group N. I am very aware that this is completely like different contexts and uh, uh, that uh, <clears throat> we might not find uh, many uh, red threads uh, between uh, these two groups, uh, but uh, this is a sort of experiment and let's enjoy uh, in you know, trying to figure out uh, if there is anything to, to be learned from, from this comparison. So I would like now to welcome our guests, uh, Vida Knežević and Jakopo Galberti. Uh, I know Vida for a little less than 20 years, I guess. Uh, we studied art history at the university in Belgrade uh, together and our paths have crossed many times since then, both in the field of culture and in political struggles. Vida is one of the founder and editors of Machina, a media portal that publishes news and analysis from left perspective. For all of you interested in the updates about the struggles in Serbia, there is a section in English on their webpage, so please consult it. Uh, I met Jacopo during my fellowship in London in 2017. We met for the first time um, in a physical space in Manchester, where he organized the event Art, Domestic Work and Social Reproduction with Silvia Federici and Leopoldina Fortunati. Um, the event took place in partisan uh, Manchester's cooperative art and social space. So it was a very interesting encounter because uh, Silvia Federici and Leopoldina Fortunati that used to work together met each other after many, many years. Um, so I want to use this chance uh, to thank both Vida and Jacopo uh, for their work over the years. Uh, thank you, Vida, and thank you, Jacopo. I have learned so much from you, and thank you for finding time to, to join this. Uh, conversation tonight. Uh, I have chosen Grupa Život uh, and uh, Group N as a case studies because of their close relationship with political and revolutionary movements of their time, but also because of their involvement with discussions about individualism and collectivity, issues about artistic labor and art production. So uh, let's start our talk uh, uh, now, Vida. Would you be so kind to tell us a little bit more about the motivations of the members of Grupa Život? to come together in this particular context. So this is an interwar period in Yugoslavia. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you, Anna, for this uh, beautiful introduction uh, and for this very important update from the Serbia uh, political situation. And uh, I think we will see many similarities with the period, interwar period, uh, uh, about which, which I will uh, talk more, and uh, uh, group uh, Život uh, that was engaged in, in this pre-war uh, period. Uh, and thank you, Kuda.org, Daria, uh, Gorka, Doran, and all uh, participating in this uh, project. Uh, so at the beginning, uh, just briefly, uh, okay, I will put uh, just the, the maybe presentation, uh, just the first uh, um, image. Um, uh, so at the beginning, just briefly uh, to say a few things about the group uh, Jivot uh, or life. Uh, the uh, art group uh, Jivot was established in the interwar period uh, precisely during the year 1934 as illegal art group that was directly uh, connected to Communist Party of Yugoslavia. So uh, since the members of the group and their associates were close to Communist Party of Yugoslavia, they also had to function illegally. Uh, they were never uh, publicly known under that name nor was the name of the group mentioned in any newspapers. 
So back then, when, when you actually today, when you uh, read archival material and the newspapers, you can never see their illegal name, Život. So according to the uh, Communist Party policy introduced in that time, around 1934-35, uh, the, the politics of People's Front, uh, that um, says that parties should uh, take all legal means uh, to take all uh, legal and bourgeois organizations and institutions as much as uh, they could. Um, group Život also took part in this legal official art scene. So a group functioned parallelly, illegally and legally. Uh, but, as I said, without mentioning the real name of the group, they were uh, called by art uh, uh, critiques or journalists as realists or progressives. Uh, some were boycotters, uh, and uh, all these names were in relation to their legal activities. So uh, while they were illegally working whatever uh, was necessary for the Communist uh, Party of Yugoslavia, uh, legally they were organizing various group exhibitions, uh, art events, uh, taking part in the Belgrade art scene, in the Yugoslav art scene, um, with the aim at bringing together as wide as possible a progressive front of artists and intellectuals regardless of the differences in individual style, art language, and methodology. So, uh, mm, illegal uh, group, Život, emerged in the time of state repression and censorship, uh, which were dominant in the kingdom of uh, Yugoslavia back then, uh, and it emerged as heterogeneous artistic group of pluralistic views on artist styles and directions and organized around two key ideas. I will mention uh, uh, just two uh, for our talk, very important. So uh, this notion of art as a social practice and the other uh, art that critically considers the relationship of content of work, its form, and the question of art production and how it is organized. So, uh, the, such an artistic practice, uh, which in the sphere of art advo advocates class struggle by artistic and political means, is a practice that uh, Walter Benjamin uh, defined through a clear distinction between question about the position of artwork in the production relations of this epoch, uh, but also um, it brought the question of subjectivity or positioning of intellectuals. But when I say intellectuals, I think uh, uh, public figure, artists, uh, whoever, journalists, uh, something as an organic uh, uh, intellectual. So what was the, their position and subjecti subjectivization in the political struggle? Or to put it differently, uh, they considered the question of the place of intellectuals in relation to proletariat and uh, with the question uh, of uh, their political organizing. So in, in the case of Život and the left art front that they initiated and organized a few years later, it was precisely such transversal chaining of artistic and political struggle. Uh, so I will stop here uh, with this short introduction and then we can continue the discussion.
Uh, okay, I was muted. I'm sorry. I need to repeat now. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Vida, so much for sharing this with us. Uh, and uh, Jacopo, could you please uh, try to just give us a short introduction about the motivations of artists that were gathered around the group and uh, this also very dynamical political times in, in the in the 60s? Yeah, I mean, um, the, the N group actually emerged uh, around the late 50s and its main um, goals were not uh, political so there was no uh, initially there was no connection to uh, the communist party in fact some members were about to join the communist party which was um, fairly you know progressive democratic force in 1950s to 1960s italy but because of the kind of still stalin Stalinizing tendencies of the party, they eventually refused to join the, the juvenile section of the Communist Party. So, no connection to um, the Communist Party. Uh, maybe a sympathy, uh, especially because N, the end group emerged in Padua, and in Padua, the Communist Party relied on some very um, enlightened figures who actually. Um, promoted art exhibitions that included figures such as John Cage or uh, Manzoni, so the Italian neo-avant-garde. So on a local level, the Communist Party actually was quite uh, open, open-minded. But any, in any case, the main reasons were, I would say, um, cultural. Because um, nine, late 50s Padua, Padua is not far from Venice, uh, was a fairly provincial city town, so about 200,000 people. Um, and because of the economic boom, uh, there was, a, I guess, a, a gap between, uh, you know, university educated uh, people like the members of the N group and the very stagnant provincial situation in Padua. So very little culture very little art. Um, so they kind of looked at Milan, which was much more mm, thriving in that respect. And they looked at uh, the, the Italian neo-avant-garde really. So Manzoni, Piero Manzoni, uh, Lucio Fontana and, and others. Uh, Manzoni was about the same age as the members of the N group. And he had just opened a, uh, an art space in Milan called Azimut, uh, a kind of self-managed art space, uh, which was open with, uh, because he had the support of a kind of wealthy uh, lawyer, I don't know exactly, but uh, someone who was not directly related to the art scene. Uh, so the end group actually tried to kind of uh, emulate Azimut, so they opened uh, a studio which was also the exhibition space. Um, so I guess the reasons were initially uh, cultural, they wanted to kind of um, raise debate in this provincial town that was becoming richer and richer. Uh, so I just wanted to give you, so okay, this is a, these are the members, but I'll, 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 I'll comment on this image later on, but I want to show you uh, an example of the very early phase, which was both, uh, I would say, let me check. Okay, where is the part? Okay, sorry, I forgot to add this image. Um, so the, the early phase was actually uh, marked by two kind of antithetical uh, strengths. So on the one hand, uh, the end group was quite Dadaist in a way. So very ironic, self-ironic. I will find the images in, the image in a second. Uh, on the other, it was, it relied on the kind of modernist tradition of, you know, 1920s, 1930s uh, modernism. I don't, I don't quite like this term, but I think it's useful for the sake of clarity. So this is a kind of example of what the end group actually produced around 1959, 1960. So this is a very, it's extremely basic, it's just cardboard, right? So it is 
ironic to a certain extent, just three pieces of cardboard put together. On the other hand, you know, of course they kind of elaborated on, 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 on this and they argued that it was, there was more to it than just irony. Um, and I think um, there's a kind of indirect connection to, to this, to Newman, Barnett Newman, and possibly a kind of attempt to, to kind of satirize the mystical dimensions of Van Newman's painting. So quite similar, but made of cardboard. And this connects to the new avant-garde. So industrial materials, industrial production, uh, and a kind of um, attempt to, to produce works that resonate with the economic boom of and, in, and, and its material culture. Uh, so these are more or less the kind of reasons that, that brought the Yang group to life. Yeah. Well, I, yeah. I exit the share screen, sorry. Yeah, uh, I have, I, I didn't see the images. I was just wondering, did, did Oh, did really? The, oh, okay. Rest, you see the images, Vida, did you see the... I, I saw the one, I saw... No, it's just something with the, with my... I refer to this one. All oh, right. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> human. Yeah. Thanks. Um, well, in in the direction of what we we have been already mentioning, and this is the the collect uh, the the connection with this uh, uh, um, political organizing uh, in uh, interwar period. Uh, Vida, uh, can you tell us a little bit more or about how this uh, coming together of this uh, uh, group, illegal group Zivot, I mean, the part of its uh, illegality connected to the, the practices that, uh, that were very closely intertwined with the, the Communist Party of Yugoslavia actually looked like. Uh, and uh, you can also tell us something uh, about uh, the research uh, that you, you did. Was that something that was like available as material? Uh, or, uh, yeah, what was your experience in, in looking at these mm -hmm. connections? Uh, okay, just to try to share screen. Mm -hmm. uh -huh, okay. Uh, so, um, yeah, this was uh, the part of my um, research in the film of uh, a PhD that I uh, in, in finished uh, last uh, year or two years ago. I cannot remember, <laughs> but it was a long process of uh, uh, researching and writing. And um, actually, what was very interesting for me and at the same time striking was the archival material that was uh, publicly available uh, but is um, somehow in contradiction with the historization of this uh, uh, group in art historiography but later i will tell more about it um, uh, but uh, just briefly about the historical context um, for the people uh, that are not uh, so familiar with, with, with one. Uh, the, the capitalist order in the Kingdom of Yugoslavia, the, the economic crisis, the general militarization of society, and the rise of right-wing political forces, uh, the pronounced class differences and the general uh, authorization of the population are just some characteristics of, of, of this period. Um, and from the early 20s, uh, the Communist Party was banned and uh, it became popular among the, the people. Uh, so the party started working illegally. And this was the situation till the beginning of the war. So all those who were in any contact with the Communist Party were their members or sympathizers uh, taking part, part in their activities were uh, constantly accused, arrested, jailed, uh, tortured, even killed in imprisonment. So uh, constant precautions and conditions of illegality 
brought this changed language of communication, writing, addressing. So among the broad left, uh, specific, something like, like a code book uh, for all those terms or notions uh, that should not have been publicly expressed was introduced. Class, class struggle, proletariat, uh, etc. Otherwise, the entire state repressive apparatus engaged. Not only were many uh, newspapers, texts, books, magazines, uh, programs, exhibitions banned, uh, censored, confiscated, uh, but many of the actors I researched about or upon were imprisoned, physically abused, and tortured and classified as political prisoners. Uh, very interesting to talk about these issues in, in the contemporary political situation in, in, in Serbia. Uh, therefore, it seems to me that uh, it uh, is important to bear in mind uh, that it is also one of the specificities of the Yugoslav cultural and art context in this uh, interwar period. Uh, since in many European countries, uh, Communist Party was uh, legal. I don't know about the situation in Italy, whether it was illegal or legal Communist Party between the uh, interwar period, but according to Gramsci's imprisonment must be legal. Uh, I don't know, maybe a couple, you can comment on this later. But um, all these different uh, so socio-political and economic contexts, for example, uh, in Soviet Union, um, Communist Party was in power, Soviet state. Uh, in France, it was, it was legal. Uh, and uh, Yugoslavia was a rare country where Communist Party was illegal. So this uh, should be kept in mind when thinking about the specific, specific artistic practices involved, uh, such as the one related to group život, as it shaped their dynamics of work, uh, but it shaped, shaped also the language, style, art methodology that were uh, involved. So in that sense, uh, the left media back then uh, mostly newspapers and weeklies had a huge role in theoretical articulation and social interpretation uh, of the reality, but also served to disseminate the specific strategy of the Communist Party of Yugoslavia and its politics of people's front in this very pe period uh, of which uh, I'm talking about. So most artists around the group Život took part in the production of these magazines as writers, as illustrators, as designers, publishers, agitators, and organizers of the party work. Um, I, I will just briefly mention some, some names. Uh, Veselin Maslesha, Braće Bihali, Jovan Popović, Moša Pijade, Otto Karkeshovani, Mila Dimić, August Cezari, all those names were very important left intellectuals working constantly illegally and legally, connecting political and party work with legal work as journalists and public figures and intellectuals. So if we consider the artistic and political practice of uh, group uh, Život as inherent to Yugoslav revolution, and if we define the Yugoslav revolution that already started in this period as contingent, intersectional, transnational, avant-garde, communist, feminist, and anti-fascist breakthrough, which uh, through the politics of continuity uh, with the politics of solidarity and organic co connection, organic connecting, led to transformation of social conditions of production and social uh, relations, it gives us completely other dimension of group practice than the one 
um, how it is already historicized. So uh, I think that uh, when we are thinking about their art practice, but also political practice, one should have in mind all this that I, I just mentioned. So just briefly to, to uh, show some uh, newspapers and the figures, uh, protagonists of, of, of this uh, period. Okay, maybe maybe I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you, Vida, for, for this very important point uh, that, you, that you made. Uh, um, I know that the situation in the 60s in Italy was completely different, uh, uh, but uh, there is also one, uh, uh, let's say, crucial moment in development of all of these like, leftist movements uh, in that period, and that was the time of what they called uh, uh, red terrorism, and this is also something that affected the, the work of the of uh, the group N. Uh, but maybe uh, you can tell us something about the connection between the the Puerista movement and the the the, the group N for for the beginning. Of course. Well, first of all, I, I wanted to reply to um, Vida. The the PCI was uh, outlawed in Italy, in, so the. Communist Party was outlawed in 1926, I think. So yeah, it was outlawed. Um, so actually, the, 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 the so-called Red Terror is actually something that characterizes the 70s and even the late 70s and the early 80s. So it's something that uh, is subsequent to the story I'm, 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 I'm telling. The actual encounter between uh, some members of uh, the N group and um, Operismo uh, dates back to the to the adolescence because Padua, as I said, is a quite relatively small town, and they actually they just knew each other. So, for example, uh, the sister of one of the artists was was friends with with Negri, who was slightly older, perhaps. Uh, so it was an absolutely chance encounter. In the beginning, but then something ha happened around 1963, because um, in Venice, on the kind of um, dry land of Venice, of course not the touristic part of Venice, uh, there was a and there still is a, a massive uh, petrochemical factory. And in 1963, uh, a wave of strikes um, brought the factory, and actually. It was very surprising because the trade unions were not uh, in favor of uh, these strikes, or, or, or rather, they were in favor, but they were mostly uh, the initiative of, of, you know, grassroots activists within the factory. And this is something that uh, surprised many people. Um, Negri was uh, very close to these uh, strikes, and some members of the end group actually began to question their political views, began to question the role of the trade unions, which they began to see as relatively internal to the system, and began to question the role of the Communist Party, which, as I said, was very moderate, um, despite its name. It was only nominally communist. In fact, it was a socialist, uh, democratic. So um, this is just, of course, uh, part of the, the situation. Uh, the strikes were um, also in Turin, in Fiat, which was a much uh, bigger factory. Uh, but what happened was that Negri and uh, other activists, uh, you might know, uh, you might know uh, Tronti, for example, Mario Tronti, uh, launched a magazine. Um, and the um, Massironi, so a member of the of the N group, joined this uh, the editorial team of this magazine. I'll show you the layout in a second. And actually, took care of the layout, which is this one, 1963. So the first issue uh, dates from 1964. Um, 
I mean, I could comment on this layout. It's very modernist, sophisticated layout, which refers to other Italian magazines through the masthead. The, there's the kind of, um, the fact that the, the C and the O here are not capitalized, probably hints to 1920s um, modernist graphic designs, which saw capital letters as kind of hierarchical, as right wing, just to put it very briefly. So it, it's a quite subtle, it's a quite subtle layout that codes some political messages and also outlines the kind of uh, punch lines of Tronti's prose in, in red here. Um, in fact, so I don't want to discuss, I can't discuss uh, the kind of political view of operism in detail, but maybe we can say to kind of uh, draw, um, or to make a comparison with Vida's paper, that um, Operismo was basically the opposite of the um, policy, but advocated a different um, political view from what the, the Communist Party was uh, um, trying to implement. Uh, so it was much closer to, let's say, the slogan, class against class, as to the frontist policy that characterized the 30s. So if you want, Operismo um, dismissed Gramsci's idea, Gramsci was dead, of course, but uh, the PCI uh, claimed the, the kind of um, legacy of Gramsci and of his, of his thought, and Operismo rejected the idea of hegemony. Uh, Parisi and, and Class Operaia uh, was the main outlet, uh, argued that the kind of the economic boom was reshaping uh, the Taylorism, which was a relatively relative novelty in 1950s Italy. Um, so the main idea was uh, that the working class would expand to a point where um, even intellectual workers or skilled workers would slowly be included in the class. So the idea was that uh, the policy of class against class was the common future rather than the past. Also, uh, the frontist politics was uh, dismissed as a kind of uh, a moderate attempt to, to to get rid of some fascist elements from the government, but that really didn't question the economic system. Um, so I would just kind of summarize the point. I would say that the, the encounter with the Parismo was made of a chance or personal acquaintances, but also from the kind of huge impression that these strikes made on the artist. Uh, in the summer of 63. Uh, and of course, this is um, the kind of the, polit the politicization of the end group began then, uh, when some members, particularly Massironi, who actually, as I said, made the layout of uh, uh, Tasso Paraya, began to use a parisma to kind of think of artistic practice and to think of the position of the artists within capitalism. But this is maybe the topic for another question. Thank you. Thank you, Jacopo, uh, for sharing this uh, very important contextual and political differences that emerged uh, between um, uh, Communist Party and Operaismo. Uh, now, uh, uh, I think this, this is a very good moment to go into, uh, let's say, in, ideas uh, that were generated in this kind of uh, intellectual climate that is important for the types of uh, 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 for the forms of organizing that emerged uh, within the, the space of art. 
So, um, yeah, the, the question would be now, Vida, uh, can you tell us something about the, the let's say, the mainstream ideas uh, 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 about individualism and collectivity and also the interventions that the group Život uh, has been making uh, with uh, uh, their way of organizing outside and within uh, uh, art world, so to say? Uh, yeah, just to see... Uh... I lost my presentation just to try it. Mm -hmm. oh, well. Okay. Um, yeah, so just uh, briefly, I will say uh, something about the initial point for the formation of the group Život. Uh, and then I will just uh, uh, mention to, to a few arguments about the question of uh, anti-individualism and collectivity, uh, uh, which was uh, inherent uh, to their art practice. So, um, Actually, the first uh, event that uh, was very important for establishing the group Jivot uh, was um, uh, one event happened in 1932 when artist uh, Mirko Kujacic, who uh, actually later initiated the idea about the group and, and became one of its main protagonists, uh, published his influential manifesto called My Manifesto, so you can see uh, two pages, original pages of the, of the manifesto. Oops. Uh, and then organized a sole exhibition uh, at the Art Pavilion, Svieta Zuzoric, something as a performative act. So he wear the workers' suit. Sorry? Uh, I think okay. Zorane, could you please mute, mute yourself because <laughs> we can hear you. Okay. Uh, um, so uh, he um, exhibited his previous artworks, uh, but also two other ones. Uh, two white paintings. Uh, on one, he hang a boot, real worker's boot, and on the other, uh, a real onion. Uh, and in front of all, he read his uh, manifesto in which he renounced his previous uh, bourgeois art uh, uh, practice. And uh, he gave a draft uh, of a new art he wanted to fight for. So he addressed uh, in this manifesto harsh economic conditions, social injustice, precarious position of artists in the kingdom uh, society uh, and um, somehow it was a turning point uh, and it radically influenced uh, many other artists already affiliated with the address problem. Uh, the, the gallery, uh, the Mentioned Art Pavilion one, was one of the main uh, exhibition spaces in uh, Belgrade many people were coming there, many were visiting, and it was kind of huge event back then, and many articles in newspapers were uh, telling uh, and writing about it. Uh, some were criticizing it from the uh, right-wing position, some from this bourgeois notion, um, criticizing this performative act, uh, and, but many were writing positively about it. Uh, only two years after these events, under direct influence of the manifesto, art group Život was formed. So, uh, according uh, uh, to one art historian, um, group never had any written manifesto. According to others, uh, they had, and the base of their manifesto was this one, Kujacic, but uh, according to this, uh, to another one, everything was destroyed in uh, uh, one of artists' atelier during the Second World War. Uh, so um, 
So here I would highlight just two uh, parallel directions of activities of this illegal group, uh, which were simultaneously intervened and intersected. Uh, the one uh, was the conscious uh, de decision to change the means of production by taking over the media of graphics or printing uh, as the main one, uh, as the ma one that enables accessibility and mass reproduction, which would lead to the politicization of artistic practice by artistic means. And the other practice uh, of, of the group was the struggle for better material and working conditions of artists uh, in the particular context. And it was an important contribution to broad revolutionary movement led by Communist Party um, that led to final victory over fascism and creation of new socialist society. So we have to bear in mind that this uh, social transformation happened. It wasn't like in Italy that still capitalist uh, social production and social relations were still after the Second World War, but here this experiment with self workers uh, um, organization of society was in power after the, the Second World War. So also this some notion of uh, art production and of art uh, um, distribution were uh, inherent to, to later socialist system, but with very contradictory uh, shapes and aspects. Uh, so members of the group Život uh, worked to form a movement uh, called Boycotters, which was formed around 1936 as a movement against the precarious economic position of artists and against the politics of the only then official exhibition space, this uh, art pavilion Svieta Zuzaric in Kalnegden, just to uh, show you this pavilion, because this uh, pavilion is very important in uh, nowadays in uh, contemporary artist struggle. Uh, so their goal was to bring together a front of progressive artists as wide as possible regardless of the specific of individual styles and approaches to art artistic design. So they wanted to establish the kind of flat art front. So they started boycotting the art pavilion, Svetsa Zuzaric and their management, uh, as they disagreed with the exhibition policies, but also with the exploita exploitative tendencies towards majority of artists. Uh, then, according to uh, communist uh, policy back then, People's Front, uh, they took over the Art Association of Fine Artists of Yugoslavia, uh, which was established uh, uh, at the beginning of 20, 20s as a kind of bourgeois art uh, institution. Uh, and what is very important for uh, actual and uh, contemporary events is that this um, art association still exists. Uh, and at the moment, it is in the uh, epicenter of contemporary struggles for better working and living conditions of artists and cultural workers in, in Serbia. Uh, so, um, they, this whole movement led by uh, Group Život, members of Group Život, uh, set up a series of independent exhibitions called Salon of Independence uh, in various uh, spaces, uh, often improvised exhibition uh, spaces uh, connecting to the exhibition work, their political work with their artwork. Uh, artists organizing with broader political organizing. Uh, as they were part of the organized revolutionary movement, all the sections of the movement interconnected uh, additionally. So, for example, students were organizing uh, additional discursive and educational material. Uh, unions were invited uh, 
were invited workers to visit the exhibition where they could find various information, conspiracy plans, propaganda material calling for supporting the revolutionary fight, for example, in Spanish war, anti-fascist material. So they organized help for the most vulnerable people, but also produced illegal documents necessary for the members of the Forbidden Communist Party. So all these illegal and legal work they um, connected, and it was very important uh, aspect of their work. Later, I will tell more about the, the uh, how they defined artwork in itself. Thank you, Vida, for, for these insights. And uh, Jacopo, as far as I know, um, the, the ideas of collectivities uh, that were developed within the, the, the group N uh, were uh, connected also to, to criticism of this kind of like capitalist idea of uh, individuality. And the, the group also um, was a part uh, of, uh, let's say, more artistic kind of movement, the movement New Tendencies, but also this spirit of 60s where collectivity was something to be celebrated in the world of art uh, as well. Can you tell us something about all of these uh, things? So, uh... Let me share the screen. I, I wanted to begin with this image, which is not that of uh, an N group member, uh, but rather that of a, an, a, an ex expressionist, abstract expressionist artist called uh, Vedova, who was based in Venice. And he was a bit of a star in Italy in the early 60s and late 50s. This is the kind of uh, artist against which the N group uh, position itself. So the image is quite telling, I think. Uh, one man covered with uh, painting. Uh, it almost seems part of the painting is, is making. Uh, you know, it, conveys ideas of strength, dynamism, um, you know, intense feelings. Well, the end group, this is, I mean, this kind of group portrait is a kind of reply to uh, Vedova. So it couldn't be more different, you know. Sober, uh, very kind of mm, elegant, and the very protagonist is not, you know, brushes, is not paint, is a vertical drill, right? Um, this is the a poster they made for an exhibition. So I think this image is, is quite telling so far as it, tell, it, it describes or defines a group that is almost or wants to, to kind of picture itself as a group of technicians. Right. Um, so the idea of collectivity was initially very much rooted into uh, the group's uh, faith in science rather than politics. So science, as uh, this might no longer be the case now, but back in the 50s, a rather mainstream view of science was that science uh, was characterized by a clarity, rationality, um, open discussion, um, and of course, science was constituted a form of cumulative, cumulative knowledge. And this is the kind of spirit that initially um, animated the, the end group. I wanna show you some uh, pictures, some, some, some of their works, which were mostly, uh, mostly based on optical illusions. Uh, these are just uh, squares, right? You can see here, just a square that... Uh, people are just saying that they can't see the images and I also can't. Uh, oh, we only okay. see the first one. Okay. Finally, I can see it, so maybe it's connected. <laughs> when I see it, no one else sees it. 
I was wondering, I thought Anna will tell. If she doesn't see it, <laughs> no, then we'll, it will all be no. <laughs> so What should I do? Should I, uh... Maybe you can try Maybe share screen again. Stop and share again, yeah. Okay. yeah. So, share and share again. Can you see it? The first one, yes. Okay. So that was the image I, I commented upon. Uh, and then I moved to this one, which I described as a kind of antithesis, antithesis of the. Then I wanted to show you some works that, are, as I said, mostly based on the idea of optical illusion. It's it's a very you know it's op art you might have heard of this trend uh, in 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 a, in a positive I mean it's it's got a kind of negative connotation but it's um, for example this is a work that is made of thread right these are plastic can you see it can you see it now no we just see yeah. the image for some reason I don't know. I'll do that again. Maybe start from the second image or something. Yeah. Technicality. Or maybe even show them from another program. Now we see, uh, okay. yeah, op art. Yes. Again, this is a this is a, this are th plastic threads made of plastic, right? They're, they're, these are not uh, drawn, or and of course the kind of squares and the lines here are purely optical illusions. Um, so the idea of, of working collectively was initially uh, rooted in science in, in the in this kind of scientific spirit of the, of the 50s. But then, um, and, and, and as I said, it was a reaction to the kind of very heroic personality of the art of the 1950s mainstream figure of the artist. Bear in mind that Van Gogh, as we know him today, as a very romanticized figure, uh, is something that emerged in the 50s, right? So the 50s, for, for reasons that would be, you know, Quite, that are quite complex, are a time where this figure of the genius-like artist becomes mainstream in Western Europe. And the end group is, embodies a sort of reaction to this uh, trend, which is of course ideological and, and inextricably related to capitalism and the idea of individualism as it was developed in in the 50s in Western, in the free world in Western Europe. Uh, but the thing is that, okay, so first of all, scientific and then rather political. And this shift occurs around 1963, which is really a crucial period for the end group. So what happened was that the workers and the strikers of Porto Maguera, so Venice, uh, suddenly seemed to kind of provide, to offer, a model of collective action, uh, which was autonomous, which was radical, which was um, spontaneous, at least in part. Um, so, and kind of try to, to rely on this model. So they kind of ditched science uh, around 1963 and try to collectivize uh, their production, so they kind of they thought of a way in which they could share more and be more kind of uh, communal. So they they um, outlined what they call the contract of uh, um, uh, collectivization, contract of collective collectivization, uh, whereby they kind of um, sh share. They committed to share the working materials, uh, the money they earned. Um, so everything became a bit more kind of um, formal, um, and and of course they signed their works collectively, 
uh, but th this kind of collectivism be became more politically minded around 1963. Um, but again, I think it's we shouldn't forget this kind of background. Can you see the image? No, oh, really? It's the same image. Yeah, yeah, it's the same image. But if you can see, the others cannot, right? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Daria, what, what can yeah, you Yeah, but I cannot see, so. <laughs> I can't see it. <laughs> Sorry. If, if Anna, if both Anna and me cannot see, then we have a situation. <laughs> no, I see it. I, I just see the, the opera image. Maybe I can. So again, uh, maybe just to summarize the main point, I would say that there are two compatible uh, uh, ways of collectivism. One that comes from science that characterizes the, the early phase of the group and the other that is mostly political and communist minded that characterizes the lesser part of the group's history uh, and which um, leads to this kind of contract of collect collectivization that was meant to last for 10 months and which proved uh, too radical for the group. So basically, and this is a crucial point, maybe one that we might discuss. The main problem was that it was it was a, a way to kind of collectivize uh, means and income, but they came from different backgrounds. So some of them had a job, some of them had a rich family, some of them, um, you know, could afford to focus on uh, our production, whereas others could not. So this kind of social and class differences uh, made this kind of uh, rather artificial collectivization uh, unworkable. It was undoable on the long term. And so they began to kind of argue. Some people said that, you know, the end was not revolutionary enough, that this kind of um group was was a, was kind of instantiating a sort of bourgeois revolution and so the the group collapsed but collectivism was was a key was a key uh issue um for, for the end of the group yeah i i will stop here now Thank you, Jacopo. I mean, I think this is uh, something, uh, I mean, these issues that they faced, uh, I have been also facing many times in uh, uh, my attempt to work collectively with many people. So I think these uh, issues of, uh, you know, how to, um, how to create the situation of equality in completely unequal situ society, you know, like society that is producing all of these differences is uh, still a very big uh, uh, challenge for all of us. Uh, but uh, uh, and, and until, until now, we have been uh, talking mostly about the, uh, the let's say, the, the, the relationships uh, that uh, kind of uh, uh, created the uh, possibility or the dynamics uh, within this uh, collectives or like in broader context. Uh, uh, what I would like to ask you now to reflect upon is uh, what kind of uh, uh, artworks uh, uh, were actually the, the result of uh, this kind of organizing and thinking in this collective? Vida, if you can share uh, something uh, of your insight mm -hmm. about... Uh, mm -hmm. the, you already told us something about uh, Kujacic and uh, his uh, boot. Um, was this something that was characteristic for uh, the work of uh, Group Život, this kind of approach too? Uh, yeah, um, I, would, I would not say. I, I, I think that uh, this um, queer church uh, work and uh, performance is something uh, that was kind of experimental uh, back then. But it can show us uh, the connection between previous avant-garde movements and the ones that were defined as 
social realism or, or socialist realism or as Lukacs would de define it as critical realism, uh, which I think is the most precise uh, term. But in uh, Kujacic's uh, work uh, and uh, his manifesto, we can uh, see the uh, direct influence from Zenitism on one side, through this um, uh, way of, um, of uh, you know, this uh, words and sentences, metrics in sentences in the, his uh, manifesto that he wrote. Uh, and um, in this uh, maybe Dada, anti-art, uh, the ready-made uh, elements uh, in his uh, oil paint, not oil paintings, but paintings, white paintings with the uh, ready-made. Uh, but also with this performative act. Um, and here we can also trace the direct influences uh, of uh, surrealist uh, movement. Uh, that was very important uh, during the, the end of the 20s and early 30s uh, in the uh, Yugoslav context. It was very important. Uh, they uh, uh, wrote a lot. They um, um, made different kind of uh, art events, even in this art pavilion, and they were really influential figures uh, back then. So. Um, uh, when you read um, um, art historiography after the Second World War, this modernist one about the group life, uh, little we can read about these connections. But when we uh, read uh, archival material, we can trace the direct connections. For example, Kujacic. Uh, had uh, direct contact in Paris with uh, brothers Mitic that were um, the main figure of the uh, Zenitist movement. Uh, on the other hand, he was very, very connected to surrealist uh, uh, movement, especially with the members that were later uh, openly uh, left or uh, precisely uh, oriented for Communist Party and became party members. Uh, this was the younger uh, group of younger members of, of the uh, uh, movement. So we can trace this uh, archival material, material that proves us that uh, it was uh, continuation between uh, avant-garde movements of 20s and early 30s and later this movement uh, that actually just changed the uh, language of art and and the way he articulates the, the, the art struggle. Uh, so just briefly uh, to to um, show you some images. Uh, the main methodology and the art uh, uh, method was graphic or printing, not oil painting. Uh, I said previously, oh, uh, I, whether uh -huh. I didn't share screen. Okay, sorry. So, for example, this is the graphic map of George Andreevich Kuhn, uh, called Bloody Gold map of graphic uh, that he produced uh, between 34 and 37 um, and uh, he uh, literally went to uh, uh, bore mine uh, 
lived uh, with uh, uh, workers, mine workers, there for a month. Uh, he entered the mine and he um, artistically presented their fight uh, for better working conditions. Uh, first strikes, even ecological strikes that were organized around the area of war. Or just uh, some other, Mirko Kujacic also, the, the, uh, he was um, presenting the, the work of uh, fishermen. Or uh, Radojca Živanović, uh, who was a member of Surreal uh, movement, but the only one who was a painter, because the majority of group was, uh, uh, they were uh, writers or poets. Or Olivera Vera Chohadric, uh, that presented the, the work and life of uh, uh, constructor workers on the periphery of, of uh, Belgrade. Uh, so just uh, briefly, I would like to, to uh, say uh, about uh, their thoughts uh, of artwork. Because, uh, for example, in, in uh, uh, Manifesto of Mirko Kujacic, he defines the figure of artist as a clerk within the capitalist mode of production, who is rewarded with a piece of bread for the work done, I'm quoting, while at the same time, the privileged class obtain the artist's luxury product. Otherwise, each artist loses the condition for a bare life. Or uh, later, to the processes of this political uh, organi organizing of artists um, that were gathered around the group boycotters in uh, 36, uh, boycotting this uh, art pavilion Pietro Zuzoric, um, they also wrote a significant uh, document called Resolution of 30, in which they were saying, uh, just briefly, I, I will. Uh, by misinterpreting the artist's work in our country, they created an inaccurate belief that the artist would be outside the social process of work and social economic relations. However, it is indisputable that the work of artists is conditioned by the economic relations of society. Even those who claim and assure themselves as genius uh, was born out of misery if they hoped little over reality and if they were not professional illusionists, they would have to see clearly that the artist had all human essentials to eat, to work, to live. So I think that um, uh, this, um, how they defined their artwork is something that can be also significant for uh, us nowadays when we are uh, thinking uh, about the notion or definition of art work in the uh, contemporary cap capitalist uh, art production. But also we have to bear in mind that it was, that was completely different uh, political context and the definition of, um, art work was completely, it was articulated in, in other contexts. Uh, later on, I will just briefly, uh, I will talk more about this, uh, um, how they organized uh, and how, how they misinterpreted misinter after the, the Second World, World War. Thank you, Vida. Um, 
And Jacopo, how about the work of uh, Group N? Uh, what came out of these 10 months of their attempt to uh, create a, a group based on, on equality, on egalitarianism? How did this materialize in the, in the work of arts? You're muted. Uh, it was not. It was not directly visible. It was mostly uh, instantiated through the signature, and through the mechanical um, um, approach they embraced. A again, uh, for them, there was a clear connection between science, uh, collective knowledge and uh, a form of art production based on more or less scientific methods and, and techniques. So this was a kind of uh, link. Um, I think there's a, there's a, there are quite a few interesting uh, differences between uh, the end group and uh, the group Vida is um, uh, describing uh, life. So basically, um, there was no attempt to um, to claim uh, the figure of the artist, or rather to reclaim it, or to say we as artists we need to, um, you know, have we have a specific role. Quite the opposite. Uh, and now I'm talking about the most politicized fringe of the group, which was the only one they actually wrote texts. Quite interesting. So it would. They were signed collectively, but they were written by the most politicized members. Uh, so basically, I would say that, that there's a operismo um, was used to, as I, as I mentioned earlier, to rethink the position of the artist and its role within the working class. Uh, so there was a kind of um, the idea was that artists uh, are part of the working class. Um, they should look at look to workers as model to organize, to strike, to um, oppose um, conservative culture and capitalism within their fields. But uh, the idea was that artists were salaried intellectuals, or potentially at least. Um, where um, intellectual workers, that was more or less the kind of formulation that came, that became um, quite common within 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 this milieu. So, as intellectual workers, they were perhaps skilled workers, but nothing else than workers. Um, and. Mm, so, and for example, criticized uh, a major art critic uh, that was an important figure for the new tendency as well, um, Carlo Argan, um, who was actually supporting uh, the end group among others. He was uh, supporting that kind of uh, reliance on rationality, collective working methods, but and uh, actually disliked his uh, rather um, progressive but not communist approach to the to the art production. Uh, so Anne replied to his eulogy of Anne, saying that uh, the art critic was a bit like a trade unionist, in so far as the art critic kind of um, improved or, or um, increased the value of labor, but did not liberate it. So from a kind of operator perspective, which is also that of what Lenin called leftist uh, communism. So a form of communism that opposed trade unions uh, as a form of, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's in the kind of uh, extremist form of, of communism. Uh, trade unions are, and in fact, this is quite accurate for Italy in the sixties, uh, you know, are there to kind of, to allow for the integration of the working class into the capitalist system and, and its productivism. 
the, the, the kind of analogy between a, an art critic and a trade union is, is meant to be uh, derogatory. And said, uh, basically, I mean, we're fine with art critics, with intellectuals that talk about uh, artists. This is not a problem per se, but what we expect from them is that they help us clarify our ideological issues rather than trying to uh, understand our work from their point of view. So in a way, um, this kind of art critic artist relationship reminds us the relationship between the activist and the factory worker within operismo. And there's a, there's a quite interesting word they use, which is co-research, communal research. So it, basically communal attempt to understand each other, but with a specific goal, that of fighting capitalism, combating, combating capitalism. Um, and I wanted to go back to the, to the issue of not being an artist, or what is art actually? If you use industrial material, if you refer to science, well, one of the one of the attempts to redefine art was uh, based on the uh, Greek notion of techne, which and mobilized to say, basically, everything is art as as any form of applied uh, knowledge that tries to change something, be it like a shoe or 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 you know, uh, the oil industry is a form of techne. So there's no, there's nothing specific about us. We, we're not artists, we're not, uh, you know, um, we're just skilled workers in a way. There was, there was the attempt to kind of uh, rethink the connection between our industry and labor. So at the end of the contract, th th there is much to say because uh, quite consistently with their position, they basically left the art world. Apart from one of them, everyone left the art world. They became experts on um, optical illusion, uh, teachers, industrial designers, um, which was quite consistent with operismo in a way, which was uh, a political doctrine that, you know, uh, was not against industry. The point was to be, this is a slogan of operismo, within and against it. So to kind of struggle from within um, the structures of the relations of production. Uh, and some some members uh, joined Potero Prior, which was a 1970s group that kind of uh, claimed the legacy of Class Prior. So in a way, they they kind of followed um, Operismo's trajectory up until the early 70s, when uh, some of them became a bit had reservations towards the kind of uh, the often the kind of militaristic approach of the group that became quite dominant around 1972. But this is a different story and was was over by 65. Thank you, Ecopa. And Vida, uh, what was the relationship of uh, the, the group uh, life uh, towards uh, let's say, artistic labor, artistic work, how did they conceptualize this within like the broader struggles? We know that the, the, the issue of work is always very important to, in, let's say, left-wing left, uh, left -wing organizing. It was important before and it is important nowadays, so it would be great to learn something more about that. Mm -hmm. uh well, um, as I said, um, they already in this Kuyacic um, Manifesto tackled the, the question of artwork. Uh, and they were uh, connected it to uh, every other uh, work. Uh, they were 
against uh, this, you know, bourgeois notion of of of, uh, of um, privileged um, uh, uh, genius uh, artist uh, that could, be, you know, just uh, from his heart. Uh, uh, um, uh, produce uh, uh, beautiful art objects, but uh, uh, I have to uh, uh, comment that uh, this is completely. I mean, it is uh, completely other time and specific context. Uh, apart from what Jacopo was saying about you know how opera is. Uh, articulate uh, the the work uh, as uh, some kind of um, opposition of this mo modernistic uh, strive for uh, more work and for less work and for some you know leisure time. I think that. Uh, artists around group Život were struggling to um, articulate in this broad public space um, that art practice is something that uh, is any other social practice as any other work. And those were the main um, arguments when they were attacking the institution, main institution of uh, uh, art back then, that was this pavilion that I was mentioning. And uh, many discussions uh, that uh, we can read about that were going on around this pavilion uh, in the period of uh, 36, 7 until 39, because they took over this uh, association of fine art that was behind the pavilion uh, that was very important in uh, exhibition management. So when they took over this association, because two main uh, members of the association were members of Group Jivot and were uh, strongly connected to Communist Party. So they were opening the set of questions that were tackling the, the, the uh, notion of art as any other work. What uh, Jacopo was uh, uh, explaining, you know, in maybe from contemporary Marxist theory, it is much more sophisticated that uh, the uh, the um, articulation of uh, group uh, life. But uh, we have to, on the other hand, we have to uh, have in mind that all this left intelligentsia uh, in this period in Yugoslav context uh, was um, strongly connected to. Um, Soviet um, theoreticians back then, uh, maybe more this uh, Lukács uh, Lipschitz, Lipschitz, Lipschitz uh, theories of critical realism, but also to uh, German and uh, German Communist Party and how they articulated um, artwork. Because many of less, few, let's say, of, of uh, Yugoslav intelligentsia were part of German Communist Party as well. For example, Bacha Bihali, Veselin Matvasha was a student at um, Frankfurt School as well. So all, all they transmitted this discussion about uh, left art and what should left art be, you know, in the capitalist uh, uh, social relations, but they were 
articulated what should be in different kinds in, in, in social, uh, uh, socialist uh, uh, relation. Thank you, Vida, for this uh, intervention. And Daria, could you, uh, before I go on with my questions, I would like to invite you to uh, share with us uh, if there were any discussions in the chat and maybe ask questions from the audience to, to uh, our guests. So first, uh, I would like to say that the conversation is so fascinating that um, I wasn't even like bothering to ask people and to check check about questions. Um, we, we do have, of course, but um, I just wanted to mention uh, shortly that it's, uh, to me personally, it's fascinating the amount of issues that, that we can see in parallel today on, on many levels. So, for example, the struggles of the Art Association and Tieta Zuzoric in terms of uh, institutions in Serbia uh, then again, uh, strikes in board and questions of uh, of ecolo ecology and also um, rights of workers and basic health, right? Uh, that are completely the same today and probably even worse. And then also the the also this idea of the group and that they're not against industry but kind of within and against it. Uh, we have a lot of similar ideas happening today, for example, with um, Tatiana Bazikelli's work on network disruption and uh, these interconnections between art, activism, and disruptive business. Thinking of uh, the field of disruptive business as the field of uh, disruptive art. Um, so we had one, uh, one question from Anthony Isles, uh, who is a writer, researcher, and editor at Mute Meta Mute magazine. Uh, to Vida uh, about the name of, uh, of Zivot. So um, uh, he was asking how was the name of Zivot used and how was it arrived at? Uh, there was a suggestion in the introduction to your talk that the name was never used publicly. So how did it circulate uh, privately within the group or secretly to other readers or was there another public name? Uh, yeah, uh, um, uh, what I was uh, uh, learned from the archival material and uh, reading about the, the uh, material from the, the uh, um, secondary uh, secondary material and uh, art historian text. Uh, they uh, were never uh, used the name uh, Zivot publicly. It was illegal. So only the members uh, knew about it. In public, they were um, they were uh, known as uh, uh, boycotters or they uh, as progressives or realists. And it depends dependent, uh, on uh, which legal activity they were practicing at the moment. Uh, but uh, then the question is uh, how we knew about the, the, this legal name. Um, many of the uh, protagonists uh, uh, survived, survived the war. Uh, so they were uh, then telling the stories uh, about the group, how they engaged, uh, how they communicated, uh, um, how they gathered together, uh, what was the means uh, when they were communicating with Communist Party. So there were some interviews that were very uh, interesting. Uh, uh, vivid and uh, telling a lot about the uh, way of uh, organizing themselves. And sorry, just maybe one one uh, important uh, um, uh, notion is that um, after the Second World War, 
there were uh, several uh, exhibitions, but maybe the, the, the major exhibition in the Museum of Contemporary Art, uh, through which the public uh, learned about the, the group uh, Jivot. Uh, the exhibition was organized in the 60s, I forgot the, the, the year, exact year, but it was organized together with uh, um, other avant-garde movements such as uh, surrealism, Zenitism, uh, etc. Thank you. Um, we also have a question for both of you on uh, what do you think the work of an artist uh, how should it be valued in view of this, if only as a means of production or as a part of visual intellectual discussion in these times, specifically? Jacopo, I think you should take this one. Um. <laughs> I don't, I don't see the dichotomy between visual production. And so, what was the other, what was the other term which was used? And so the question goes like this: How do you think uh, should the work of artists be valued in view of this, if only as a means of production or as a part of visual intellectual discussion in these times? Hmm. Um, so I guess this is the question, I mean, what, what are we discussing here? I mean, we are discussing, you know, we are not actually discussing the work of art itself. Mm -hmm. For most of the time, no? I see the, the idea. I, I, think, I think today uh, visual production is a much, much stronger phenomenon than it used to be. Back in the 50s and 60s, fair enough, some, some magazines, even mainstream magazines, talked about art, which was, of course, something great. But today, but producing images, uh, circulating images, was much, much more difficult. And art and visual production was mostly confined to galleries, museums, and, you know, uh, sort, sort of elitist uh, um, context. I think today, uh, the visual production is everywhere and, and I think it has a much stronger impact. And I think artists can really do much more than, than they used to because of this visual world we live in. Um, so I think, um, I don't know whether I'm answering this question, but I think um, um, the the main point i guess is that producing images and, and and the political and social economic context within which this production takes place um is part of the visual production um is not here are the conditions and this is the object i think and this is one of the, i guess the main legacies of the 60s is that both belong to the same um, to the same phenomenon huh? each object embodies also i mean this is what i think at least uh, the the material conditions that allows that allow for its existence vita do you want to take this one as well yeah uh, uh, i would uh, agree with Jacopo and um, the group Laj uh, or Jivot is a very interesting example uh, in relation to the, this question because in um, later historiography usually the art itself that they were producing were defined as a less value uh, in, uh, when one would compare it with, uh, uh, you know, avant-garde practice. Uh, or avant-garde practice that was influenced by West uh, avant-garde. 
uh, art practice uh, related to group život uh, was uh, defined as party oriented, dogmatic, tender tiers. And it was, and you know, um, under the influence of uh, uh, Soviet social realism, Zdanovism, uh, etc., and all those were very negative uh, definitions of uh, art pra practice. Uh, and it was deeply uh, connected to this famous uh, discussion. Uh, uh, which uh, was uh, named as conflict of the left or conflict of the literary left, where those two questions were in opposition, like on the one hand, uh, struggle for uh, auton autonomy of uh, art work or art production, and uh, the other one, uh, the strong party uh, influence on um, art work or art, art production. Uh, I will not uh, talk more about this conflict because many books were written about it and this is something that we can uh, trace uh, from the 20s till the nowadays. So it's very interesting uh, discussion, uh, which in the center uh, of uh, it uh, traces not only the notion of production, but also the, the uh, you know, val value of art or how should we define art and many other questions that, that are very uh, interesting and important. Uh, for contemporary art production as well, critical art and many other, um, you know, art notions that are related to critical art uh, practices or avant-garde art practices, uh, etc. Uh, I think, yeah, thank you both for, for these uh, great reflections. Um, uh, I mean, th this discussion actually leads to, to contemporary moment and what to do about the living wages and working conditions of artists. And this is what also Bernadetta Hopkins that asked this question is raising now in the chat. But I would park this question for the moment just to try to finish what we started and have like a, uh, let's say, multidimensional view on uh, our uh, problem. And I would ask the, the last two questions that I had in mind. Uh, when I, when I invited you to, to join this uh, talk. Uh, the first question is, uh, I will, will put them all together and then you can find a way to answer them because we are running out of time now. Uh, so the, the first question is related to the, the gender aspects of the, the collective work of uh, these two collectives. Uh, uh, as I said at the beginning, uh, in parallel, uh, there is a working group uh, that is uh, kind of reflecting on all of this material that was collecting during the research phase of this project. Uh, and we are meeting on Mondays. Uh, and the last Monday, we actually discussed also the, the, the article written by Lina Juver Juverovic about the, the gender aspects of the work of OHO group. This is a group that was uh, this is very famous Yugoslav uh, uh, group uh, uh, and uh, um, I mean she was really trying to look inside of the relations uh, of the members of this group and what was the place uh, of for instance a uh, woman uh, in, um, in, in, this, in their practice, in their work and how they are reflecting upon these issues uh, from contemporary perspective. So that would be my first question. Did, did, was there any consciousness uh, uh, about the, the gender issues uh, in uh, the, the interwar period and then uh, back in the, 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 the late 50s and 60s in, in the, the case of the group N? Vida, if you want, you can take the, the first one. Uh, yeah, uh, okay, yeah. Uh, this is an interesting uh, topic and I uh, would uh, really like to research more upon this uh, gender perspective of, uh, of um, 
activities of uh, group život uh, because it is interesting and once again i have to uh, mention the whole context so it was the whole revolutionary movement uh, and the only one part was this uh, uh, left art front but there was uh, students revolutionary movement very important back then in, in the interwar period they were uh, it was mass movement uh, one of the major in europe back then uh, very radical um, workers movement connected to radical trade union back then but all those uh, these were connected to this legal policy of communist party that led all these fractions of the movement and uh, the third uh, movement that was very important was uh, women movement uh, so um, in the broad liberal women movement that was strong in, in the uh, kingdom of Yugoslavia in the interwar period in the 20s and etc uh, this uh, specific youth section of women movement was the most important and uh, uh, the the woman uh, women connected to youth uh, section were uh, directly uh, connected to communist party so it was like uh, uh, women uh, cell or women uh, line of communist uh, party so they find the legal way how to articulate and distribute uh, various uh, questions of uh, women uh, position in this patriarch strongly patriarch society in the kingdom of Yugoslavia so they were tackling these uh, uh, questions and critique of uh, uh, capitalism capitalist system but together uh, with the, the how it is uh, the, strongly connected to patriarchy and this uh, burden of a woman in the family in the society and this unpaid work and all these questions that were very important uh, that were uh, articulated and written through the magazine called woman today established during the 1936 very important i will show you this uh, uh, image if i can maybe it's too late to show but maybe you, you saw it uh, i think mm. so uh, many art women artists connected to group Zivot, connected to uh, left art front and this whole movement around the um, boycotters and uh, uh, art uh, association and pavilion uh, were deeply connected to women uh, to this magazine so artists were uh, women artists were designing it illustrating the material writing articles but they were also taking part in this political education of women workers especially the textile workers because many uh, women workers, female workers, uh, were in the textile industry uh, that was developing back then. Uh, so they were going also in the city periphery, educating women in health issues, teaching them some of the basic courses such as sewing and typography. Uh, and again in the same time they were illegally working as party members organizing party cells bringing important party messages connecting unions etc so i will just briefly mention a few names so the uh, boba georgievich she was a, a painter graphic designer uh, uh, 
connected to revolutionary student movement, but with this uh, youth section as well. Then Paulina Sudarsky, Vera Trohadric, Shana Lukic. Uh, they were all artists uh, uh, strongly connected to uh, uh, group Jivot, but also connected to this youth section uh, of uh, women movement, um, collaborating to the, together with, for example, uh, Mitra Mitrovic, Dobrila Karapanjic, uh, Olga Kalai, Natasha Jeremic, Dora Sher, Milica Shuvakovic, Milka Žicina, Fanny Politeo Vučković, Olga Timotijevic. I'm mentioning all these names because they are very important for this period. And majority of them were um, died or killed as political prisoners uh, before or during the war or killed in the war, so just few survived. Uh, so yeah, I think that, that this uh, gender dimension is quite important uh, aspect of, of, of group uh, work. But uh, just just a sub question: How did it reflect in the the practices of uh, uh, of group or um, mm -hmm. I saw. Uh, I mean, I don't know that much about the group and how they functioned. I saw that the, some of the members of the group of Jivot were also women. But do we know anything about how the dynamics uh, of the relationships within the collective worked or not? Uh, uh, we. Uh, we do have, but uh, uh, the, the, the core group was male, male uh, dominated, as, as uh, we can uh, read. I, I couldn't trace the, the, the first, uh, that uh, in the frame of the, their first meeting that uh, any uh, uh, woman was present. But later on, how the group was, um, uh, uh, active in the forming this uh, uh, front and because uh, they couldn't uh, be compromised with uh, you know legal work uh, many of their members were not uh, uh, written down uh, but those few names that I were mentioning as Boba Djordjevic, Vera Djokadzic, Paulina Kudarski, Shana Lukic, they were directly connected and we traced some documents about it. Uh, and uh, uh, they were, through their art practice, they were thematized uh, all these questions that, uh, that uh, I was mentioning. Uh, in, in relation to uh, uh, women today. Okay, thank you, Ida. And Jacopo, I mean, for, for the Italian case, we know that uh, there was like a feminist stream of operaismo coming uh, in the 70s with wages for housework uh, campaign. And, uh, but uh, what was the situation in late 50s, in the beginning of 60s? It, it, was, a, it was quite awful, I guess. I mean, um, <laughs> unlike... Um, uh, Yugoslav fascism uh, confined women to the most you know, traditional and uh, abject uh, spaces, so producing babies for the for the country, uh, mostly uh, being you know faithful woman and, and so on. Um, and this had a you know fascism unlike. For example, Nazism lasted for almost 20 years, so that had a major impact on, and still has a major impact on the Italian culture. Um, women only uh, voted in 1945, so when the group um, emerged in the late 50s, uh, you know, women were, you know, fully citizens for about 15 years. So it was probably not even the first generation because they were in the late 20s. So they were mostly born in the 30s under fascism. 
Um, some female artists, of course, uh, were active in Italy, in Rome, Milan, even in the late 40s. Um, some female artists were actually close to the group, like Dada Maino. Uh, within, within early Operaismo, some activists uh, were actually women. Um, and one of them uh, went on to become, um, to kind of team up with in 65 when the N group um, um, was, was discontinued. One member teamed up with um, um, a female activist to create a kind of duo who experimented with electronic music in 1965. Um, so that, that suggested there was a kind of, um, not, I don't know what, how to interpret that, but uh, so the group was, was made of five, five men. And, and I guess um, the kind of uh, imagery they rely on. So I showed some images uh, like the, the drilling machine and this kind of very industrial um, imaginary they, they evoked uh, was still perceived as a, you know, male dominated uh, world. And um, so I think the reason, unfortunately, much to say about, about feminism or women within, within the group, uh, around the group, you could sense that there was something happening among activists, among uh, some, some individual artists. But within, within the end group, mm, not really. Um, feminism became quite, you know, quite interesting. There was, a, as you said, a very interesting connection between operism and feminism that was in the 70s. And there were some groups of uh, Marxist feminist artists were uh, launched around the issue of wages for housework in the mid mid six sorry mid seventies. Um, I think uh, yeah, I mean uh, I, I don't know. I didn't, I didn't find much about women, but I think uh, the I, I tried to show you the screen again. We'll see if that works. I mean, you can. Let's see. This image shows a lot about about this young man. Can you see it? Yeah. Um, I mean, apart from key to this one, all all of them has have a roll neck. You see. And well, this is a this is a you know that suggests that they didn't want to iron. And they were not; they were unmarried. So, in a way, um, it tells you a lot about the fact that they were single, that the, you know, the kind of they were intellectuals. Um, so, the, 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 I can say, I mean, you can have a kind of, um, you can analyze some of these images from a kind of feminist perspective, I think. And this, you know, very and a vertical drill, of course, you know, we can we can think of it as a kind of phallic symbol, uh, which is the, the protagonist of of the image. I mentioned industry as kind of being implicit in this in this iconography, in, and I think this is correct. But you know, it's a vertical drill. So I think you know, you know, I'm a bit being a bit ironic, of course, but I think uh, it could be an interesting. Um, research project. Thank you very for, for, for this comment. Um, and uh, my last question, uh, with which we can actually open our discussion towards contemporary moment is actually um, what happened to the history of, uh, um, of these uh, um, art groups and their practices? So how, uh, how are they perceived uh, today? From what I know, uh, I mean, the, the Grupa Život as many other groups and practices in this process of transition, so-called transition in the uh, so-called Eastern European countries, uh, um, ended up uh, as uh, kind of like victims of this uh, 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 process of historical revisionism. 
uh, and uh, I'm not really sure what is the situation in Italy, but from what I, I never actually heard uh, before about the, the group and or their connection with Opera. So I guess that this is also not something that is uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, out there and uh, spoken uh, about publicly. Uh, and Vida, maybe you can tell us uh, something about the, the perception of uh, the work of uh, and practice of the group Ajivot today uh, in the local context, I guess. Because I, I don't think that the group is known much wider than in the local context. Yeah, yeah. I think also in the local context is uh, making more um actually many colleagues of mine uh, when uh, they asked me what was the topic of my uh, phd they commented that they never heard about the, the, the group life or if they were uh, knew about it then they would connect it to this uh, as i already mentioned this uh, modernist uh, Cold War perception as you know, dogmatic, connected to uh, Soviet uh, uh, social realism, uh, Zdanovism, etc. And it was like, uh, ah, okay, uh, at least boring. <laughs> um, and yeah, I already explained the, the reasons why uh, the group was uh, defined as it was de defined. And I would say that the majority of um, art uh, history papers that I wrote were in that atmosphere. Some directly, some indirectly, but uh, Mostly, they were only analyzing their artwork without any wider context, and it was and this is the problem. Uh, this whole activities related to um, uh, politically uh, political or, or organizing of artists that was very important to, uh, back then and still for, for our knowledge, uh, contemporary knowledge, almost never mentioned in these uh, papers. Uh, of course, on the other side, uh, in this uh, frame of contemporary historiography and art history, uh, which is under the influence of uh, historical revisionism, as Anna mentioned, uh, the, the group was uh, not in the. Uh, it was not of interest <laughs> to put it uh, in, in this uh, work. But I have to comment, and I have to uh, say that there were few exhibitions about the group activities uh, recently in the frame of activities of the Museum of Contemporary Art in Belgrade. But still, uh, quite depoliticized and again without deep relation to communist party. Or when they were mentioning it, they were mentioning it as this dogmatic influences they were told how to do it. It is without, or not it, it, it is with, without any, but you know, little of art value. Um, so uh, I, I think uh, that uh, in, in um, you know, uh, this contemporary critical um, analysis. I think that what is the value of this uh, um, material, this is this, uh, I, I think we should uh, perceive it as living archive, uh, that something that we should learn from it in order to understand better the contemporary situation. 
Uh, and this is very important uh, because nowadays there's the huge struggle uh, uh, in the independent art scene and with artists connected to this association of uh, fine artists uh, and in the frame of having you're not having yet is a rich that has this long history. Um, well, the, the reception of, of or rather the kind of legacy of the Young Group is quite interesting because, as you can imagine, it was mostly exhibited within, you know, exhibitions devoted to op art, which is often uh, completely depoliticized um, in a way that is quite often misleading because some groups were like Grave in France or um, some uh, Croatian groups were actually very much, in, you know, connected to political ideas and Marxism and the 44 and Marxism in all its forms. Um, in, to a certain extent, it was not, um, it was partly be a one of, I mean, the artists, the members of the end group played a role in it because basically they signed their works collectively, which was um, a major limit if you, when they began to apply to uh, teaching positions, for example. Because of course the commissions wanted to evaluate your individual work and that was not possible if you, you know, didn't have, you know, an individual production. So they kind of produced a book in the late 70s that accurately described the way in which they work so collectively, but then in the, in the place where in signed individually, which was not consistent, but for, I, mean, I guess the missions mostly look at the works at the plate, so didn't read the text. And so actually they kind of, the five members created five different styles, but this, this is not something that really existed within the work, within the group's production. Um, so because of this, but this book became basically the main reference until 10 years ago. So people tend to assume that, you know, there were four, the end group was made of five artists who had five more or less different styles. Uh, but this is not correct. Um, and 10 years ago, a, a new book came out uh, that kind of um, told the same story in a, more, in a more interesting way. And for the first time, this book mentioned the fact that they shared the studio with Class Opraya, but it was just like uh, two sentences. But when I read this book, which was 2010, I think, I realized that that was quite interesting, also because the group's texts were not understandable without uh, grasping the link to operaismo. Um, so I realized that there was a, you know, the, the kind of reception of this group was completely biased. Um, and it was reduced to, you know, kind of all part group, uh, who liked optical illusions. Um, and also this is a big problem, I think, because if you work with technology, uh, you risk producing very outdated material very quickly. So uh, what was technological in the early 60s, it's ridiculous today from a, I mean, from a contemporary perspective, not from a historical perspective. And I think this approach is partly what made this group so, um, so bland really because you know who cares about you know very basic optical illusions i mean i i don't i don't quite see the point to be honest uh, so i think the, the political connection is much more engaging and and actually interesting for contemporary debates Yeah, thank you. Both. But maybe for the end, we can also try to just shortly reflect and then I will let you go. I know it's already too late. Um, 
about the, the contemporary struggles in art in this situation where, uh, um, I don't know how to, how to even uh, name it, uh, let's say it's uh, very complex and there is a lot of like uh, struggling narratives uh, within. Uh, I mean, Vida, you said that you would like to, to try to connect the, the practices of group Život and the contemporary struggles to, today uh, in, in Belgrade, in Serbia, wider. Uh, so, if you would like to share some of the things that are happening, um, that this would be the great moment. Yeah, I already mentioned a, a few, but but I think that um, this historical fact and the re relation between art and politics, in the sense that art had this horizon of the strong political actor. Uh, which led to uh, to the changing social um, relations is something that is all obviously lacking lacking in the contemporary situation. So contexts are completely different. Uh, but I think that um, uh, what is uh, going on uh, at the moment in in, in Serbia and in, in Belgrade uh, precisely is very interesting uh, because you can trace some similarities as uh, uh, we saw back then that uh, um, progressive artists took uh, over this uh, association, bourgeois association of fine artists uh, and through this changed uh, step by step uh, this uh, um, the whole notion of uh, uh, economy, art economy around this uh, uh, art pavilion. Nowadays, uh, uh, I would say many similarities are going on. So last year, this uh, progressive group of progressive artists, I would say, um, not took over, but dominated uh, uh, to, uh, in the frame of this art association of fine artists that still exists. So this is the the, the same art association, uh, and still uh, this uh, uh, art association is in the in this art pavilion. Till the last year, this pavilion and art association was very traditional, very conservative with many layers of, uh, you know, this uh, notion of um, uh, historical revisionism, very right-wing, I would say, uh, but uh, with this um, uh, changed uh, um, how should we put it, this uh, change governing bodies in the art association um, open the horizon of really progressive art struggle. Uh, when I say this, I mean to, uh, to uh, uh, the definition of art, contemporary artwork, what does it mean, uh, how, what is the relation uh, between art work and capitalist uh, uh, social relations and uh, many other things. And what is happening now is that this association is forming a kind of uh, a huge progressive front with other uh, uh, represent representative uh, associations and uh, uh, independent teams in order to struggle for better working and uh, uh, living conditions. So it is very interesting, and it is interesting because it is in, uh, the struggle is going on in this very same space. Uh, and this is still a very new event. Uh, the question is what will be developed out of this initiative, uh, but uh, still it can be said that uh, this is unique artistic initiative for so long, <laughs> and this is showing a tendency for political organizing of artists in order to improve their labor rights, better access to their social rights, 
but also implement, implementing progressive exhibition policies. Uh, but what I learned from this historical struggle of artists uh, uh, is the fact that the struggle is possible only if the struggle is connected to, you know, this broader uh, social and political struggle. And this is what the historical case showed. Uh, and the struggle of artists in the, in the world period was just a part of this revolutionary movement that organically connected all other struggles, you know, workers, uh, students, uh, uh, women's struggle. Today, you know, this political horizon is lacking, obviously, you know, but hopefully this one contemporary uh, struggle will be the same. Let's see what will happen in, in future time. Yeah, thank you, Vida. Uh, I was uh, uh, attending the the was it the closing of the 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 exhibition? Um, was it the spring exhibition? I don't know which one was that. Uh, anyway, now in the spring. coming spring exhibition, yes. Yeah. Uh, and and I have to say that uh, it had a, a something of a feeling that there is something special going on. Uh, yeah. There was a, a new the text uh, from my dear friend Olga Dimitrievich was uh, read uh, during the, the closing ceremony and it's a, it's a very crazy text about like a, a, it's a metaphor of contemporary moment where you know like people are busted just for protecting trees uh, and at the end there's this like whole madness happening the trees is pulling its roots and you know like everything is like changing and fighting you know for like a just society. It was very uh, yeah it was something very different like having in mind what was happening before in that space. Yeah, but Anna, I was uh, at the same event and it was the first time for so long that you know uh, around this pavilion the words such as political struggle, communism, fight, let's fight, uh, women's struggle were mentioned and you know it, it was on the open space, open page so it was fascinating uh, to be part of such an event, and yeah, of course, that I I also felt the same. <laughs> yeah, and uh, Jacopo, how about the, the the let's say like contemporary uh, collectives in Europe today? Is there any uh, like issues that were raised by Group N or like uh, anything that was happening in that particular historical moment? Uh, can we? kind of pull any like lines or questions or like connections with the something that is going on in contemporary moment i know that you also like did some research about some contemporary art groups and collectives so maybe you can tell us something that you know i think could be like important to understand how the historical continuity of this struggle work i, I want to um connect with what uh, Vida's just said, I think it's perhaps one of the lessons to be learned is that you, you, you need a social movement and you need to be part of it. You can contribute to the emergence of a social movement, but um, without a social movement, you can hardly do much. Um, that there was pretty clear because when 68 uh, uh, kicked, out, kicked off, some artists of the young group actually basically said something like that. The only, the only art, the only one that actually remained in the art world said, yo, okay, so now, you know, we wanted to be collective, but now this is a different challenge, this is a different stake. Uh, we need to, and it was addressing the new tendency actually um, was kind of caught between, you know, it was quite ambivalent about the movement, didn't know what to do. Um, and it was, um, so the only artists who actually continued to pursue his career, um, possibly, you know, question is, it's the collectivism of an art group when, when 68 appeared. And I think uh, the idea of individuality is something we really need to think about. I think this is just as relevant today. And how, you know, 
being an individual, valorizing your individuality is something that we need to, you know, very critical um, of, I think. Uh, in the art world, this is still, of course, we're not, we're no longer in the 50s and, and the kind of romantic idea of the genius is over for good, I think. And still, we still, the art world still needs, you know, a distinctive signature, a signature style. Um, and this is something that um, I think we need to question and challenge. Um, I don't know how, but it is, this is possibly one of the lessons we can, we can take from, from the end group experience. So like, like a, for example, I really like, but this is just an example to, to add some, something concrete. Um, regardless of what they actually produce, I think the authorial policy of a, of a duo like Claire Fontaine is quite interesting um, because they don't, they don't develop a style. Um, other groups, of course, can be mentioned, but I think this is something that is very much political, even today, a style, individual style. What is an individual style? Why do we need that? To make money, to, to sell, to be identifiable. I think this is a very political question. Yeah, I have to say that I agree with both of you. Um, several years back uh, i also brought this article art and activism and for that one i'm like heavily criticized all the time because i draw the same conclusion that <laughs> which you two just did uh, so i guess this is like a start of uh, like a big polemics <laughs> i would say but uh, we will have to leave it for another time for now, I would like to thank uh, you both for taking part in this uh, comparative experiment uh, and for sharing uh, your experiences. And um, I would also like to thank the audience for uh, their comments and questions. Uh, and especially like to thank Daria uh, for doing all the technical stuff and moderating the chat and Food.org for making this happen. Thank you all once more for this uh, great session. Uh, at a time when the whole world is in rebellion uh, against neoliberal status quo uh, in the time of COVID pandemics with unforeseeable consequences, um, the urgent question becomes how to rethink the way we organize everything. And our small contribution in imagining the future is opening for new reflections on collective autistic practices, uh, which itself has often faced similar challenges of rethinking uh, and redistributing everything. Today, we heard about the struggles in the interwar period in Yugoslavia and in, 60s, in 50s and 60s in Italy, how we articulate that history and what we learn from such artistic experiment is entirely up to us. At the end, I would like to wish us all a chance to create a better society in which no one will be hungry without a home and the right to health care. I wish you all a pleasant evening and I hope to see you all on July 28th at 7 p.m. Central European time, where we will be taking, uh, talking about the political economy of art uh, collectives with theorist Katja Praznik uh, and Sezgin Bojnik. Take care and goodbye. Thank you. Thank Bye. You. Thank, Thank you, Anna. Thank you so much. <laughs> oh, that was a great conversation, really. Um, yeah, I could uh, continue with this like forever, uh, but uh, uh, we had to stop okay. at some point. <laughs> I, I, I have to enter this huge building, Anna. <laughs> Please stop. <laughs> if you need, uh, you know, a company on the phone, you can call me. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Okay, thank you all so much. It was wonderful. Bye. Bye.